Hey y'all, welcome to the Clock Tower. I'm Colton, here with Brandon and Darcy. Brandon, yeah. <laughs> this looks weird. What's going on? Where are we? Well, Something's this is wrong. Darcy's channel, so I'm going to let Darcy take over from here. Yeah, so welcome back to my podcast. Um, thanks for all the returning listeners uh, for coming back. It means a lot that uh, people want to listen to this. And I have guests with me. I'm here with uh, Brandon and Colton. Um, to American YouTubers for Watch Wars from, yeah, from the United States, which is it's good for me because I don't get much uh, cultural perspective on things all the time with Watch Wars if it's not from like regions of Asia. So it's really uh, I I really enjoy being able to hear like people from the United States and America and Latin America or whatever. What did I say? USA, Europe. Um, just getting their opinion on things because obviously. Uh, probably until recently, Wash Horse has been quite different, but I feel like right now everyone's kind of like on the same, same wavelength, just like, just play Dell, that type of thing. Um, but no, we've got a few topics here that we want to discuss and just kind of hang out. Um, so let's start with, you know, you two and, uh, like kind of how you got into Weiss and then, uh, why you started the YouTube channel. Well, um, I suppose I'll go first because mm -hmm. I guess the story kind of me. So I was a competitive Pokemon player for a couple of years, not a good one, but I played a little bit in the competitive circuit and I knew about the existence of Weiss during that time, but I had just assumed it was so niche that there really wasn't like an American audience for it. So I didn't really pay it much attention. That makes sense. Yeah. But then at one point I was like, you know what? I'm curious. Like I, I had gotten out of Pokemon at this time and I was like, you know what? I don't know what this game looks like. I don't know anything about it. I'm going to look into it and see if it's any good. And I started looking stuff up and I was interested and I think I sent Brandon a text message, actually, and I said something like, hey, this is a thing. I don't know if you know it exists. It's called Weiss Force. It's an anime card game. And I think I want to try to do this, but I'm not going to jump in unless I have someone I know I can play with. Because Brandon, being the one who like got me into anime and like was my first like D D DM the whole mm. nine yards so, like he's the guy who like introduced me to this culture basically at large so it just made sense that i would be messaging him about it and he said yeah let's do it so we bought our first trial decks and we kind of jumped in from there so you guys uh came in together like at the same time yes, yes we did wow what around um, what I year was this as well by the way uh it was actually about 2019 um i came in with the card captor trial deck oh yeah um, yep and i got lucky and found a horror he trial deck <laughs> at my at my local um game shop wow they they had tried to stock weiss at one point and they found they couldn't make it work but they had a little bit left and one of the few things they had left was a horror he trial deck and i was like bet that's crazy i, I wouldn't even like associate like, when I think about English White Shores, I just think I forget how he even exists, like, so often. Like, it, it, it's I mean, so old now. <laughs> it's pretty forgettable, honestly. I've been trying to keep it in the cultural zeitgeist with mixed results. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk about how a bit later, because I have a feeling that someone might have taken <laughs> it to BSFO, but I might be wrong. Oh, no. Uh, I feel called out. No, no, we all like horror. I used to have Horuhi in, uh, in Japanese, and then I sold it to my friend because he got really into Horuhi. And then he later on went to back, max out the deck. So we're, we're big fans of Horuhi here, so don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, and um, then, like, after the trial decks, did you guys go on to, like, buy playsets, or did you just kind of find a deck on Facebook or whatever, and then, like, that's how you kind of got the ball rolling? Uh, for me, I actually went the kind of deck building route first. Mm -hmm. um, when we started playing together, we had to figure out how to play together online. 
Oh, um, so we actually went on on tap first, mm-hmm. uh, and using just that sandbox environment to actually play against each other. And so, like, we were doing that for the longest time because we live in two different cities, like two hours oh, away. Oh, really? I kind of imagine yeah. that you guys lived um, like we're almost like neighbors in a sense. But um, no, that's interesting that you're in. Are you in the same state or just different cities? I mean, uh, barely. Barely. <laughs> uh, I'm. We're both from Michigan. I'm on the border of Michigan and Indiana. Oh, okay. So, yeah, he lives down closer to Chicago, whereas I live in Lansing, which is, like you said, a couple hours north. Okay. Uh, I hear they both actually, actually have like decent white shore scenes, like Indiana and Chicago. But I could be wrong. Yeah, I am yeah. in the unfortunate spot of being like over an hour away from any kind of Weiss. <laughs> That's rough. From any direction. Yeah. But it just is what it is, unfortunately. So using online resources kind of became like what we needed to do initially. Mm-hmm. So we were already kind of we were already kind of invested in that way of Weiss online. What did that look like um, prior to pandemic stuff? Um, but kind of going with that because we were messing around with Weiss online, that allowed us to be able to kind of like what does proxying look like for Weiss? Mm. To be able to proxy out a deck before even purchasing one. That's a good idea. Um, so Yeah, and yeah. with my background in playing Pokemon, because Pokemon has a kind of aggressive rotation schedule, you kind of have to buy a lot of product if you're going to be like a top-level meta player. Which is one of the reasons, honestly, why I didn't really make it very far in the Pokemon hierarchy is because you just have to buy so much, rotation comes up so fast, and, you know, if you don't make a lot of money, by the time you've gotten the resources together to buy the deck you want to play, it's kind of on the back half of its time as a competitive deck, right? So, for me, I'm very used to, you know, looking up decks online seeing what people are running, proxying everything, fishbowling, 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 trying to get practice games in. So for me, like the idea of buying a case or buying a complete set took a long time for me to get used to. Yeah. But I think um, what in like a competitive aspect, what's good about White Schwarz is that if you if you buy like a, a strong English deck, it's most likely going to last you like quite a while. Like if you had bought like AOT back in the day, right? It would last you mm-hmm. like just a, kind of like a, even until recently, right? Until like maybe beginning of 2021. Yeah. I think you can make the argument that AOT is still pretty playable, really, because it still has mm. good top end. And, you know, whether or not the Aaron is still viable is, you know, it's up for debate for sure. But at the very least, it's usable. Whereas in, you know, I still have some of my old Pokemon stuff, and that stuff has been rotated out for literal years. And because the expanded format is so just overpowered, it's really hard to find anything that has long, you know, that has that has all this staying power moving from standard into expanded. Mm. I can see that. But that, uh, you know, and we, we did a whole video on the things that we think are great about Weiss. And one of the things that we talked about is the fact that there's no rotation. I can play Haruhi forever. Yep, you, you definitely can. <laughs> <laughs> and believe me, I'm gonna try. Uh, uh, well, what about the YouTube channel? How did that start? Um, that one's mostly my fault. Um, I wouldn't say fault. Say, I'd say it was a good thing. <laughs> um, when the pandemic started up, um, I suddenly found myself with a lot more free time than I was currently comfortable with. Mm. Um, a lot of my job were involves um face-to-face contact human uh, human interaction yeah and because covid um especially during the initial lockdown period that we had um in the u.s that more or less kind of stopped most of what my job entailed but i was still like required to come to my job Mm -hmm. so I had all this free time and 
I was actually able to kind of start investing it into Weiss. And realistically, one of the things we were trying to do was trying to keep on top of all of the kind of Weiss details, the news, essentially, what was going on in Weiss. And because we were already kind of gathering that information anyway, it kind of made sense to start putting that kind of information out there as well. Yeah, yeah, like, I can see that. And just kind of just sharing some of our processes of like how we were doing things with others. Um, that really kind of picked up when the WSI came out. Yeah, uh, that's what I, I when I first heard about the two of you, it was from uh, I forget who played in the first round. It was Phil and someone else, maybe Jess. Phil and Jess from WSI, and I was like, "Oh, what's this YouTube channel? Never, never seen these guys before." Um, because normally, yeah, WSI like, WSI was. Oh no, sorry, you talk. I was just gonna say WSI was like the thing that really caused us to take off. We were picking up views and subscribers left and right during that month. You know, we we went from being kind of out in the middle of nowhere, no one really paying a whole lot of attention to what we were doing to suddenly kind of being thrust into like mainline Weiss tube basically overnight. I wouldn't even say just main mainline Weiss. It feels like you guys kind of jumped out of like from nowhere to like almost at the very top, you know? Like I feel like around that time there was I think Burn One was in like a little bit of a drought and then Strictly Broken had kind of stopped. And so there was kind of like a, a big gap and then you two like immediately filled it. That, that yeah, was kind of something I, that we were seeing too, because at that time there just wasn't a whole lot of uh, English Weiss specific stuff on YouTube. Mm -hmm. There was a couple different things like, I mean, Burn One was going on, but Burn was also like talking about JP stuff. Lunchbox has been doing his thing for quite a few years. years. Now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Pittsburgh was just kind of getting started around that same time too. That's true. Um, so like there was just there wasn't a whole lot of English content specific, like as a consistent basis coming out. And so we were like, hey, we're already kind of invested in some of this stuff. Let's kind of jump in and do it. When WSI came around, um, I think was it me or was it you, Colton, that had the idea of like, you know, what if we just kind of like did kind of quick recaps of the different games that were happening just because there wasn't a lot of that either. Like, I don't like remember a... whose idea it was, but it was a bad one. <laughs> oh, it was, it was good. You guys became that was like so the, much uh, work. It was like the ESPN of Wash Wars for a while. That's, that's what you guys were similar to. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. That's like one of the nicest things anyone's ever said to me because <laughs> I remember talking to Brandon being like, this is basically we're shooting for sports center here yeah that's right <laughs> and to hear someone say that means that we succeeded and that makes me very happy well we're thinking the same thing i, I think wsi at first i was a little bit uh skeptical on it um for a few reasons but um it, i think in the end it turned out to be really good for everyone who's like uh like an English only player or new to the game or uh, just kind of exposure in general. I think it helped a lot because honestly, there's not many gameplay videos at all of like top players playing against each other. Mm -hmm. Like you get exactly. kind of like burn one, burn one's probably the best example because often they can play against each other. Um, but I feel like other than that, there's not really anywhere else like to find stuff like that. And it's pretty rare to get like, people from Australia or Europe or America being able to play against each other, especially like recorded. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Like realistically, so some of the quote unquote top level gameplay that we've seen were stuff that Bushiro put out on their streams. Mm. And in, even then, like some of that gameplay would also just kind of be like pretty crazy odd instances. Yeah. Like, um, what was it? One of, the, one of the games I saw from Texas where literally one side, one per, one person didn't even throw in it, didn't get canceled. Like he didn't cancel the entire game. <laughs> and the game was over in like five minutes. That sounds like, like a Watch Wars game. <laughs> right? But it's like, but if that's like stuff that Bushy Road's streaming, like 
there just wasn't a whole lot of, as you said, top level content of like players playing players. I think WSI was really the first to really get solid videos of it mm. with actual like good commentary. Yeah, I yeah, I also didn't even think about the commentary, but you got like players like a uh, Ryan. Um, he like he he would commentate a lot, and I think I think he's like kind of like the golden child. Like everyone really likes likes Ryan. Um, all right. Well, what about um in terms of YouTube content now? Like, what do you? Well, obviously, I know like what you're up to. I probably like four hours ago, I watched a deck profile on a the six Scarborough build that was very incredibly spicy. Um, <laughs> but what else are you guys up to? Um, well, realistically. That's kind of what we're at at the moment. We're kind of like, we're almost kind of like at this kind of holding pattern because we're getting ready for um, Bushy Road Rumble mm -hmm. coming up here in December. Um, partly because we, well, last, about the last time when Spring Fest came around, we did a little bit more in-depth breakdown of kind of some of the different matchups that you'd see uh, with some of the top decks. In going into Rumble, so we're kind of like slowly preparing for that in the background, um, trying to put out something like that as we get closer to Rumble. We have this tendency, it seems, to do like one really big project every summer. Oh, yeah, in 2020, it was you know the WSI stuff. This summer, we did the Holy Grail War, which was really fun, it was really good, and I think that now that we're entering into winter, basically our, you know, our second winter, as it were, mm. on the channel, I think that we're planning on, you know, kind of continuing what we're doing, like with the schedule. The schedule has remained remarkably unchanged since we launched the channel, right? We've been doing two videos a week, every week since like the end of April 2020. And... I think we're planning on, you know, continuing to do that. Two deck profiles every month. Um, you know, we're going to keep the clock talks going. I think the clock talk is the thing that we do that is uh, most valuable to the community at large. Mm. Because I think the only other, like, news show that, you know, is released with any kind of consistency is This Week in Weiss with Lunchbox. With Lunchbox, yeah. Yeah. But a lot of what he does is also JP focused. Yeah, that's right. And one of the things that we try to do is we focus exclusively on English. Like we're never going to do, unless something changes, we're never going to do JP deck profiles. We're never going to, you know, we're never going to concern ourselves with the JP meta. There are a lot of really smart people and a lot of really good content creators who are already doing a lot of that. So mm -hmm. we wanted to focus more on, you know, because we play English. Our locals is English. Um, you know, the tournaments that we're trying to go to are English tournaments. So for us, that made just the most natural sense. And after we got started, we kind of recognized, oh, you know, most people do stuff with both formats. We are, you know, one of the few kind of English exclusive channels. So going I, forward, I think it, it's going to be a lot of a lot of the same from us that we've had hopefully you know continuing to get better and you know make things that are useful and meaningful but yeah i think that where we are right now as much as it is a holding pattern it's also i think a pretty good place i think you might be the only english only huge wise youtube channel i can think of besides uh three six cancel um i could be wrong i'm, I'm trying my hardest to make english only content but it's it's hard sometimes um yeah so do you guys and... play japanese ever I mean, um, we'll play test we play with Japanese. against Japanese. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, like it's it's less that we're not keeping an eye on Japanese mm. as much as it's we try to translate what we see into what we think is going to look like in English. Okay, because um, there is kind of that some there's a little bit of discrepancy between those two, just partly because English is essentially unbanned. That's right. Like, yeah. Full on so <laughs> like right um so when we look at 
JP stuff, we have to kind of keep in mind there's a lens here mm. that's kind of like a difference between how it's doing, how it's thriving into what kind of place is it walking into. And I think if we, if we, because we try to focus our content on that end of it, where it kind of comes into, I think it helps keep us a little bit grounded in, the, in some way. Like we're not necessarily swayed as much by trends that are happening. Because mm. the, the trends that you see in the West are, are pretty like significantly different as well in the, into like compared to Japan. It's like even like uh, using like probably AOT and Konosuba are the best examples. Mm-hmm. Like they, they're like a uh, shelf life was much, much larger and longer in the West than it was in, um, in Japan. And I, I think, I think it probably stayed around for a little bit too long in my opinion, but I think that's um, like being able to like see and understand that there's a, the way that players play is different throughout the regions is uh, I think really interesting and kind of, has what made English like a more unique format. Like I've always really wanted to to go be able to play in a, a tournament kind of in USA or Europe. Um just because the meta is is vastly different to what I'm used to in Australia. Um I've kind of had the like uh, opportunity with Springfest online. Um but I was only able to enter the Oceania region because um I wasn't able to enter Europe because it clashed with top eight. Mm. Um, okay, well, let's talk about Springfest Online then. That's a good segue. Um, Colton, yeah. do you want to start with what deck you decided to play and why? <laughs> <laughs> Just put me on blast. Why not? Um, <laughs> let's do it. So the way that the way that things worked out on our end actually were pretty good it was you know it start for us the first tournament was friday night Mm. so um it was friday night and then there was one kind of overnight between friday and saturday and then there was one that started saturday at noon i think yeah so i actually went down to brandon's oh cool and spent um a good portion of that weekend with him so that we could play in the friday night tournament and the Saturday afternoon tournament. So I think we played in both the AO and the NA regions. Mm-hmm. For AO, I knew, like, that tournament started at, I think, 8 or 9 at night on that Friday for us. Yeah. So I was like, okay, it's going to be late. Like, I'm going to be playing games until 2 in the morning. I don't want to play anything I have to think about too much. And besides, I think it's important that we have this representation, so I'm going to play Haruhi. <laughs> and I do I do want it known that Haruhi was the only set that went undefeated against Dal at Springfest. Did, you, did you beat a Dal? <laughs> I did beat a Dal. I ran into <laughs> one Dal in, like, round three, and I won. Oh, my God. And, well, because as much as, like, okay... We make jokes about Haruhi all the time on the channel just because it was my first deck and it was the first deck profile I did for the channel was basically like Haruhi Waifu. It was, you know, it's been kind of in our channel's DNA from the word go. Mm -hmm. But as much as we joke about it, as much as we meme about it, Haruhi has a couple of things that gives, or yeah, has a couple of things that give other decks fits. Mm. Like, you can shut off level 3 combos with the Mikuru. True. You can just shut them off. And there's nothing anybody can really do about it. And the level 1 combo, the you know the time machine combo, doesn't require a reverse. So both of those things play really nicely into Data Live. Like, the deck's consistency is trash. There isn't a Brainstormer <laughs> in the set that is worth playing. Like, the Brainstormer I play is literally just there for deck speed. Like, yeah. it literally like grants kyon soul it's terrible um you know there isn't a drop search there's so like the consistency is terrible so like it can't really it can't really hack it at high level tournaments for long but it can pull off wins and you know if haruhi gets lucky you know if i don't if i don't trigger a bunch and you know i get an early game cancel or two if i can maintain pace through level one with dal and not just eat a bunch of damage and die. 
I can hack it with Data Live at the very end because it shuts off the Kurumi combo, and I don't need to worry about crashing lanes because if I just keep slamming two souls, I can side. So I don't, you know, the, so the scry doesn't happen. True. And then also, like when the when the time machine effect comes on, it gets additional power. So like you can contest board with Dal a little bit in the mid game with Haruki. So. Like I tried to lean into that as much as possible. Basically, I built anti stand or yeah, I basically built anti stand by Haruhi as much as I could, and you know I went two and two with Haruhi. I think or did I go one and three? I don't even remember. Point is, I beat Dal. Like, yeah, that's I think the only you, thing that matters. If you if you beat Dal, I'd say that's the same thing as winning the entire thing. I think that's that's a pretty big accomplishment. See, that's what I thought, but people don't. <laughs> other people don't see it that way. Like when I when I tried to say that I won. Springfest, people were like, no, no, you didn't. But I beat the <laughs> no, best deck, like, so I think, I think yeah, that counts for something. They don't understand. You had the moral win. It's, it's still a win. <laughs> it's yes, good. yeah. No, for anyone, anyone, I have no idea how many people in your audience will get this reference, but as a lifelong Detroit Lions fan, I know things about moral Oh, victories. I guarantee no one's going to know the reference. <laughs> <laughs> To be honest, so, if, if you had made a, a Detroit Pistons reference, you maybe get a few people, but Lions just... I, uh, I mean, Pistons are the same song, second verse, let's be real. <laughs> um, here's hoping Cade Cunningham is great. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think he'll be good. I think so, I think so. Um, but yeah, so that was when I played Friday Night. Brandon over here just laughing. Just on a side um, tangent, I think Jalen Suggs is going to win Rookie of the Year. That's just my opinion. Oh, Okay. I think right. I, I think he's legit. I think he's going to be really good. I think there are a lot of good rookies this year. I think there are a lot of really good young talents. The NBA is really fun right now. I'm a Warriors <laughs> fan, so I'm hoping Kaminga and um, Moody um, turned out to be really good. But I have a feeling they're just going to get traded. Um, That's anyway, fair. back to Wise <laughs> Force. Um, did you also take the like Haruhi to NA? I did not take Haruhi to NA. Um, so I went hard into Konosuba. Oh, when course. Legend of yeah, Crimson yeah. came out, I thought it was going to be really good, and I was oh, wrong. That makes so much sense because I, I was listening just like I, I do this. Like what I do with podcasts is I just kind of have it on while I'm doing stuff like cleaning or sorting or just filling around, whatever. So I, I do that as well with like white shorts, but there's not really like one podcast. So I just kind of put your videos on like shuffle sometimes. And you were mm -hmm. talking today about well, not today, but like couple months ago but i was listening to it again today about um how you would you were disappointed that um konosuba was rated so highly on all these recent tier lists and is that that's because of your experience at Springfest? i it's i mean not just at Springfest. <laughs> i've brandon can attest to this i have yeah. tried to play konosuba for months and months like realistically i spent probably a good six months trying to essentially be a Konosuba main, trying to make it work. And honestly, Dal killed it. Dal mm. just straight up killed Konosuba. Like the level one Megamine yeah. overall combo is bad. Um, horrible. The horrible. union combo doesn't work because you can't get reverses anymore. Mm -hmm. So like there's no mid game in Konosuba at all. And it's top ends are explosive potentially pun intended, but also very expensive. Yeah. So if you're trying to make like the new the new Mega Mean Union, right? Like mm. you rest the two characters, pay three, and you can, you know, get the half Fumio and the burns. That sounds great until you realize that you get no stock from those rests. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're basically paying five. Yeah. Unless you close, you kind of screw yourself over for the rest of the game. Like there's no, you know, there's no coming back from that really. Yeah, it it really is like you have to win that turn, or there's just seriously nothing else yeah. you can do. And it's not explosive enough, right? Like Adventure Time pops off way harder than Konosuba in terms mm. of it in terms of its end game, and is ultimately, you know, about the same cost. Um, so I tried, like I, I at this point, this was like the end of my Konosuba travails. Mm -hmm. Um, oddly enough. So we'll, we'll, we'll put a pin in that, come back to that in just a second. I, as far as NA is concerned, I played Darkness. Okay. Because yeah. at the time, I, I, was starting to, I was starting to, you know, I had kind of shifted away from the Megamine Union stuff. I had never been high on the Aqua stuff. It was fine, but it wasn't great. 
I really liked the consistency of the darkness build. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really interesting. And, you know, I played it and I enjoyed it. I took it to Spring Fest and got completely washed. It yeah. Just it couldn't hack it with Dal was the big thing. It just yeah. couldn't hack it with Dal. Um, but ultimately, in pulling the pin back out now, the deck when the deck in Konosuba that I had the most success with was actually that really weird Komiko deck <laughs> that plays the two four event. What's the two four event? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um <laughs> You, it's, I'm trying to remember. I, I don't want to say this. It's wrong, like the Toka it... Endgame for Data Live, but on an event. So oh, like it's Stack a burn two, five. Burn five. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You put it into memory, and then any like you can spring it whenever, right? So like you, there's some things you can do to make it easier to pay the two four event. Like usually you end up paying two for it, and it goes into it goes into memory, and it sits there until I think it's at the end of your, of your opponent's point. turn. You can trigger it. You can pay. You can essentially pay two. I think it is to move it out of memory into waiting room. Put three clean on the top of your opponent's deck, and then burn five. Um, that that's sick. the deck I've had the most success with. Yeah, and actually, like it's really funny because at um, I think I, I I played it at um, Ian's Mid Spring tournament. Oh yeah, and I actually I played Matt Walters in round one. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I won. That's funny. I beat Eight Mar Fate with it in round one, and I don't know if that you know was this, really but funny. He's like a half an hour drive from where I live. Okay. I, you know, I my understanding is that Australia is generally inhospitable to human life, except for like the little portion yeah, of wild. southeastern Australia yeah, around basically. Sydney that humanity has carved out for their own safety. Yeah. So I just kind of assumed that no, all really of the Aussie and safety was well. really close together. Yeah, we we pre we pretty much all do. Um, so Mauricio, who was also in <clears throat> WSI, like mm -hmm. me and him are like like close, very close. Um, and then like uh, Sydney is probably like a three hour drive away, and that's where like all of WCC and um, Team TXC is. And uh, I'm friends with all those groups. Um, so everything's right. like fairly close because like these are the two main regions that are known for white schwarz it's like all sure. of like the west coast is kind of like vanguard um like for bushiro okay. games uh, but the east coast is like pretty much all white i would say um that's interesting yeah no, <laughs> where'd you say you were from uh i'm from canberra so that's in ACT, okay. which is the capital yeah not many people mm -hmm. would maybe know um okay so, so you take so what was your score with um Konosuba at Springfest? Oh, I don't think I won a single game. I, it was oh, terrible. You did. It was, no, yeah. you, you did. You won one. Did I win one? You at least won one. Yeah, it was a, it was not a fun experience. I did not I did not enjoy myself, that's for sure. Well, I guess Haruhi is the better deck, better record. I mean, <laughs> you said it, not me. So you technically <laughs> went X2 with Haruhi. Um, Brandon, I'm pretty sure you also went X2 in one of the two tournaments? Uh, actually, I went X2 in both. Oh. Uh, and you yeah, whereas Haruhi? I had a yeah. terrible weekend. I think I ended up going one and three with Haruhi, and then like maybe one and two or something with Darkness. Oh. Brandon, on the other hand, almost made top cut in both tournaments. Um, yeah, I had a notable loss in each of them that two players that went up in top eight. Mm -hmm. Um, in AO, I brought Choice Standby Data Live. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I what was it round two? got paired off against vince mm. um i know exactly how that went because i versed vince later on into this so yeah <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> um but it was actually a pretty good matchup um relatively close uh obviously vince won but like it was still a decent matchup and then i had each of them i had like a a, a game where the deck just died mm. um trip like triple triggered off the top with the choice combo yeah didn't you actually get a card off of it kind of thing like, yeah it was just awful um in north america i actually brought um slime yeah um and round i think round three 
Mm-hmm. Um, I actually ended up playing against June. Oh, Batman Ninja, crazy! <laughs> yeah, like the worst part is I brought him up to th- I brought him to three six, um, and then I triggered on the last swing, forcing mm-hmm. the deck refresh, and it canceled off the top. Oh, for the final attack. So it was three six cancel. Yeah. It literally was 3-6 cancel. Uh, yeah. There's a White Shores K out there that's very happy. Um, <laughs> oh, that that's pretty good still. Like, 2-2 two, two, at, like, uh, both these tournaments. Ha- wait, had either of you entered a Spring Fest before because of COVID? No. <laughs> no. No, no this, this is our first one. This is your first yeah. one? <laughs> yeah. Oh, like, X2 at your first ones. Like, I guess technically Colton also went X2, but um, X2 at your first Spring Fest is really good. So, uh, part uh, I thanks. Um, I had both of those decks ready to go. Um, I actually like after thinking about it later, I almost wish I had switched those around and gone swine in AO and choice standby oh, in, in A. Okay, because I think choice standby would have played a bit better into the North American matchups. Mm. As opposed to slime, I mean slime did really well. Like slime, I think was also a decent call too. Like, don't get me wrong, but I think choice standby was just slightly off for AO. AO because AO was also like a third of the size, right? Because AO was what? Yeah, it was. It was smaller. Players. It was smaller, but I would argue that the the top players were stronger in in oh in AU. There were a lot of strong players. Like, actually, I was surprised by how many strong players were separated out, scattered like throughout the tournaments. In regards to like, there was roughly like, I think there was roughly between seven and ten players that were called like hate pretty strong players that were likely to top mm. in each of the tournaments. Yeah, yeah. It feels like. And I think WSI had a lot to do with this. It feels like online tur- <clears throat> excuse me, online tournaments have really grown in terms of their legitimacy. Mm. I think a lot of people were kind of questioning whether or not an online tournament was viable or valid back around WSI. But now, uh, in a post invitationals world where you know people have seen that an online tournament can be very good and you know competitive and not have a bunch of inherent problems i think that these online tournaments have grown in terms of their legitimacy and their popularity which is i think a wonderful thing i would love to see an online regional every year from bushy road um i think that it gives players who maybe don't live close to a regional city access to high level Weiss, mm. um, especially on you know, especially on continents where there aren't major tournaments. Like if you're a Weiss player and you live in Africa or South America, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, that's right. In terms of like your ability to access regionals, because I think there's been one. I think there's one South American regional. Like it's just, it's you know, and I think that. Having an online tournament gives those players, you know, maybe players who you know, live in the middle of nowhere, um, in you know Asia or North America, the same. It gives them access to something that they otherwise wouldn't be able to have, and they work. Like you can run an online tournament without major issues, and yeah. I think you know overall Spring Fest went well. Like there were definitely some things that you know I think that Bushrod would want to improve for next year, but overall. The tournament itself, like the individual player experience, was really solid. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, um, I think like the opportunity it gave to so many people, um, who just couldn't have that opportunity, is just something that you just can't replicate with on like in person tournaments. I really think that it, it'll stick around. Um, it, I don't think it's going to replace Spring Fest, like when. And like down down the line, some sometime in the future when we can have in person tournaments again, I think it'll be like another thing that we'll be able to have 
like like this one upcoming right like rumble online mm -hmm. like it's not labeled as a spring fest or a championship series or whatever but it is a online tournament that people are preparing for and i i hope that we got lots of stuff like that like its own like uh its own tournament rather than it joins the spring fest circuit that's like the end yeah. goal I, I would say i think so and it's also not a ton of work on bushy roads end necessarily to host something like that yeah i don't think i think you're right i i think that they save a lot of money by just doing it online but well, and that's also a lot of headache too from just trying to coordinate the different locations mm. yeah you know there isn't uh you don't have to you don't have to pay a, a rental fee right for a discord server yeah that's right. you kind of you kind of that's just kind of your own space already but you know because brandon and i we've played online so much and you know, we're playing on Weiss Fight now, which is a really great platform. It is really good. Weiss Fight is, is really good. And, you know, because we so because we've been playing online either via Untap or Tabletop or, you know, Weiss Fight, Discord, you know, on camera matches. We, I think, have kind of a stake in the legit in the legitimacy of online play. Because mm -hmm. that's been Brandon and I have played many, many more matches online than we have in person. And we're like real life friends, you know, who don't even necessarily live that far apart. But we've played online way more than we've played in person. And I think the legitimacy of online play is something that grew during the pandemic. And I hope that it sticks around long term. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um... We're running a little bit out of time, so I'm going to skip ahead uh, a few questions or kind of topics, I guess. Um, but looking toward towards uh, Bush Road Rumble Online, are, are there decks that you're testing for it and like things that you, you you're fairly sure that you want to take, but maybe you still like want to test something else, or maybe that's like a it's a set that hasn't quite released yet, or maybe you're just sticking to your 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 name and your guts and you're just taking her here again. <laughs> I'm. I'm giving up. I'm playing Dal. I okay. tried really hard. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to be the person that solved Dal yeah. so bad. I wanted so badly. I mean, not necessarily even for my own sake. I just wanted someone to solve Data Live. Mm. I don't think that there's a solution in the current meta. There are a couple of things that play into it better than others, but I'm, you know, I I I've seen the writing on the wall. I've seen it for months. I just didn't want to read it. But I bought into Dal. I have it now. I'm playing it at Rumble. And it makes me sad. But <laughs> I, I want to compete. I'm tired of, you know, taking things that are just fun and silly and losing with them. I would like to be competitive. So I'm going to take Dal as much as it pains me. I, I'm honestly, like, uh, I'm very happy that you're, you're taking Dal. Because I think a lot of people... Um, kind of attach their own bias towards their series that they like and it becomes very hard sometimes to to remove that bias like i i'm a i really like fate as well like as much as the next guy right and i really, really want to take fate to 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 rumble online but the reality is that it's just not good against data live and you kind of have to face like the, the truth right and so yep and yeah i i I feel exactly the same way about fate. I want to take it. I bought it. Like I own it. I own mm. the cards. I, you know, I've built all of these fate decks and I love them and they're fun and I enjoy them very much. You know, like, like you said, like I just dropped the new Ilya Saber yeah. deck on yeah, the that's channel, right. you know, just, you know, a handful of hours ago and it's fun. But I say throughout that video, this isn't meta. This isn't particularly good. It can't hang with the, with the best stuff right now. And, you know, it took me a really long time to finally, like, get over the fact that Konosuba wasn't going to be able to compete. Yeah. Because I, I wanted so desperately for it to be able to compete. It's really hard to. But, but like you said, like, that's something that we all deal with, right? Like, we all have our favorite little decks. You yeah. Know, either, you know, things that were good and aren't good anymore, or things that were never good and we're just stubbornly playing because we want to. Mm. And, you know, it... it it took me a long time to finally give up on the field in the Dalmeta, for sure. But the thing is, like, this is only for one tournament. There's nothing stopping you from playing this fun deck or this series that you like throughout, like, the other six days of the week, right? You can have just 
right. you know, your dedicated time to playing a meta deck. Because I know not everyone enjoys it the same way. Like, I, I'm, I think I'm quite lucky that um, I just take enjoyment from just playing strong decks and that the series doesn't matter as much to me anymore. Like, obviously, like, mm-hmm. I really like playing my Godzillas and my Railguns and whatever, but um, I, I don't even like the Daylight Anime. I watched it so I could learn the name of the, the cards. Um, and I, I, I like the deck. I, just, I think that's quite a, a lucky thing to have. And what about you, Brandon? Um, I'm also looking at bringing data live. Um, mm. I just from, especially from what we're seeing, um, I think I think data live is going to be probably one of the strongest matchup that I have uh, versus some of the stuff that's coming out. Mm. Um, I think I think it's going to be a top tier con- uh, contender. So, we might as well just <laughs> not try to overthink it yeah in the sense um because i think that i I have a tendency to do that a little bit um kind of because as we look forward towards rumble like looking at not only representation from before with spring fest kind of leading into this like dal was significantly represented at spring fest and is still a viable contender going forward so we know that at least that many decks are available or around. So I think it's still something that we're going to need to at least be playing into. And if we're going to have to be playing into at least a significant portion of Dal, like it cuts off selective sets of what's probably going to be in that tier. Mm. Realistically, Dal is a gatekeeper in a way. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That's, that's a good way of looking at it. Like 30% representation is like, like so crazy. That's such, and, the, such a long and that was number. before the reprint. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. you're right. That was before the reprint. Yeah, I, so you can't hack it with Dal. You're not going to win. Like, yeah, if, if you if you're playing something that can't play into Dal consistently, and there are a couple of things that you know demonstrated that they can do a certain extent. Like Slime did decently against Dal. Sword Art did okay against Dal. Bofuri did quite well against Dal. So like there are a couple of things that can play into Dal that don't necessarily do as well in the other, you know, 75% of matchups. Mm. But, you know, Dal is king. Dal is, you know, the, the the thing that the meta has been defined by all year and will continue to be, honestly, for the foreseeable future. Like, I would, I would like to see Bushiro take some action to deal with this. As much as I hate ban lists, I hate them with a passion. I think that they're generally bad for card games. Dal is a different monster. It's even worse than AOT. AOT, you could at least like do something strategically, change the way you were playing mm. to counter what it does. You know, you could crash board, you know, deny Aaron his reversals. You, know, you, you, there are things you could do. With Dal, there's nothing. Like there's so little that there's so little recourse that you have to deal with Data Live. So, um, like if you can't beat him, join him. And that's kind of where I'm at on Dal for now. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Worth sorry. No, no, I was going to say, worth noting, um, looking at so, some of the lo- the decks that went X2, 66% of those decks, or sets rather, were in, were in six, where there were six sets that c- accounted for 66% of X2 mm. from Spring Fest. Dal, Slime, SAO, Love Live, and Adventure Time. Those were like, the five, technically five. I put Kaguya in that mix. It was the stuff that I'm looking for and testing for. Yeah. Because it wasn't quite out yet. No, that's right. But um, from a representational standpoint, those decks did really well and actually made it pretty far in the tournament. Um, uh, you guys might not know about this rule because it's a Japanese thing. Um, do you know about diversity rule? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that. I agree that I don't really like ban lists in especially in the like Weiss because which is like primarily primarily a casual game. I think maybe the introduction of diversity rule would like tone down data life quite a lot. because um, you might still have the same rep during Swiss, but it won't be there in top eight, which might be okay. Um, it'd be interesting. Um 
yeah, I think interest. Yeah. I, it's something uh, I would like want to see happen, just like as an experiment, and then if it's bad, to just get rid of it. I like the idea of experimenting with rules and formats mm. for sure. Um, you know, I also like better um, not printing something that's going to be insanely broken as soon as it comes into the meta. <laughs> Yeah, I I kind of agree, but like well, we knew yeah. that this was gonna happen. Like we knew that this was gonna happen when Dal dropped. We saw it. Like we we knew that it was going to be obnoxious and overpowered. Yeah. I think um, and, my group chat went crazy uh, when it got announced. <laughs> just as soon yeah. as it announced, like I I remember talking to Brandon and being like, I I think I think we're in trouble. Yeah, I think we got a problem. Um, so. Yeah, if you can't beat him, be, join him. That's how it is. Yeah, exactly. I would be in favor of experimenting with different things um, to change, you know, what what are what what the uh, what the top of the meta looks like mm. in, in in a world where it's being dominated by one thing. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if the diversity rules the play. Like, it might not be. It I can. Like, very well I, I can. Be. I can see how people would be annoyed by something that you know, kind of. It feels like it kicks somebody out of top eight who maybe deserved it to put in someone who was less deserving. I can see that argument. Um, but I also don't want to see a top eight that's just Dal mirror matches. So you know, <laughs> true. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Which I can see that too, but I also think that with, I think that also needs to be something that's very intentional with Bushiroad as they put out new things, that they need to be able to recognize, hey, this is what's going on, this is what is currently dominating in Weiss, what am I putting out that allows for there to be different opportunities to play into? Mm. Um, and Bushy Road is fully aware as well, right? Like, I pretty, I'm pretty sure Dallas is the only set where they, like, on release, basically immediately said, yeah. we're going to keep an eye on this. I, right? I wonder like, what I remember... they're doing, because um, they said we're going to keep an eye out to see if it kind of becomes a problem. And then it wins all three Spring Fests. And... <laughs> mm. I, think, I think what it was, actually, mm -hmm. is if... Eight standby data live had won all three. You might be right. That that then it would have been hit, but because choice standby won the third one, then it must be that eight standby isn't the problem, quote unquote. Yeah, interesting. Which is, yeah, which is right. It's incredible that two of the most unbelievably powerful cards that have ever been printed in English Weiss, the level one choice combo and the level one Shido event. Mm are basically seeing are, are seeing so little play i know yeah yeah like, oh. those are th when i saw those cards i'm like oh this is th these are bonkers these are insane and people were like yeah but we don't need them and mm -hmm. they're right that's even even the, the, the even more bizarre part is that they're right they don't need to play the two probably two of the best individual cards in that yeah. entire set just because of how well the eight standby stuff works together. It is it's yeah. wild. It, it is. It's kind of cool in, in a way to see like just a climax trick would be stronger than a really cool level one combo. Um, I will, will note though that um, the winner of Euro, Europe, um, Kelvin, who's uh, my teammate, um, he was using My Little Shido in his eight standby list. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that I'm testing as well in eight standby. Um, I'm not a big fan of choice just because. I have a weird thing with level one combos. I don't draw the climax. Um, I think everyone's like that, right? I hate level yeah, one combos. No. <laughs> yeah, no, like it's it, it's so interesting. Like, and yeah, like I think that a lot of people are gonna go like, this is just too powerful not to include, even if it affects the way that my deck synergizes with itself. Mm. Like, because this event is just so so broken. It is. I'm going to find a I'm going to find a way to jam it in. Yeah. Well, I mean it deals with so it deals with so many things, right? Like and that's the idea with what can 
your Weiss deck do? Can it, I think we put it in perspective oftentimes of like offense and defense, like how well can it survive your opponent's turn as well mm. as how can it deal with uh, your opponent on your turn? Like the Shido event allows you to be able to more or less level the playing field in a way. Yeah. Like you're, it doesn't, it doesn't matter as much what your opponent can do if you can get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But it's like a, there's like a checklist. And it's like, what can your deck do? And then at the very bottom, it's like all of the above, and Daylight just ticks down one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, let's wrap this up. Um, I'm going to do five rapid fire questions. So we'll go, Brandon, you answer first, then Colton, you answer. Um, okay. And it's just, we'll go through this really quick. All right. You ready? Yeah. All right. You can only use one deck for the rest of your life. What would it be? Um, it'd be eight choice slime just because of a play, play style preference. Mm -hmm. I like the heal spam and the explosive end game that it can have. Then Colton? It's Haruhi. Two soul salvage. It's so much fun. I don't, it, it's just really, really fun. I enjoy playing it. Every time I play it, I have fun no matter how it goes. So that's, that's good. It's, uh, if you could bring any title into Weiss, what would it be? I'm still going to keep pushing Doki Doki Literature Club. That's a good I think call. it's a perfect fit. That'd be cool, actually. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about stuff that has been announced in JP, Kobayashi. I want Dragon Maid so bad. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to get it, and it makes me sad. I think but we will I get want it. it. I have a good feeling. I hope so. My concern is that the, pro the only promo art that they released is manga-based art, and we don't usually get stuff that's based around the manga as much as we get anime stuff. That's true. Uh... So that's my... That's my concern. Um, but as far as that, I would say Dragon Maid from JP to English. Something that hasn't been released at all. I would mm -hmm. love to see Zombieland Saga. That sounds like a great time. Yeah, that'd be um, cool. That would probably end up in JP first. And as and if we're talking about English exclusives, I agree with Brandon. I want DDLC, and I want it badly. I it would be that so this, much fun. This year, because of the pandemic, it was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, okay, it's, it's so good. It's it is so really good. good. It's kind of scary. Uh, if you have a favorite White Horse player, who is it? Um, this is the hardest one for me, um, but I... If you have an answer, that's okay. No, like, I have... Currently, one of the players that I really uh, respect and look up to is Vince, actually. Yep. Um, just because he... How do I say this? He has... When I look for in a player, I look for between skill and strategy, like mm -hmm. he has both of those, but he also has the ability to kind of break down why he makes the choices that he does. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've been actually a big fan of his uh, channel that he's put, that he's been working with the team uh, when they put stuff out, just kind of listening into seeing some of the choices that he makes and why the choices he makes. I guess look out for Vince as the next guest because that could very well happen. Perfect. Yeah, I think I'm going to, in terms of like players to watch and learn from, I would say Vince for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I have a great deal of admiration for people who can take decks that aren't as powerful and still do great things with them. Mm -hmm. um, like we saw with you know, Davida and Cardcaptor for the longest time. That's true. Um, but like what Vince did with Goblin Slayer is unreal. Mm. Um, like that deck is just not that good, but he built something that was incredibly powerful and i have a great deal of admiration for that really really intelligent player just i don't know if there's anyone who sees the game better than him in the entire world right now yeah okay um and in terms of people i like to play against um aside from brandon it's probably um i really like play there's a guy at our locals his name is brayden he's super fun to play against really smart guy better player than me for sure and um he plays a bunch of different stuff so shout out to Braden. He's really fun to play against. Shout out to Braden from the United States of America. Um, what set are you looking forward to the most that's been announced in English? Uh, well, uh, I think my deck choice gave it away. I'm looking forward to Slime coming out later this week. I thought for a second you were going to say Data Bullet. <laughs> <laughs> it just hangs up the call. Yeah. <laughs> No, um, I'm a really big fan of Slime. Um, the the play style with the kind of almost 
just spamming as much heal as you can um kind of just fits my natural play style better mm. uh, so that's been a set that i've been on since release and really enjoyed playing with and looking forward to set two coming into english yeah cool Mushoko Tensei. I've never seen the show. I don't intend to see the show, but it has some really nice anti big board, anti standby tech that actually looks like it could give Dal a real run for its money. And I am so over Dal at this point. <laughs> so I'm hoping that Mushoko Tensei does what I think it can do to handle Data Live on board. If it does, then Mushoko Tensei for sure. All right, and then do you want to ban list in English? And if so, which deck besides State Alive would you would you want to see get hit, and how? Um, I actually don't want to see a ban list, um, partly because I think that at some point decks will become strong enough to be able to compete in some ways. That it's, I think there's a natural progression in Weiss. That's mm -hmm. what I like to see. I also don't want to see a ban list. I've resigned myself to the idea that a ban list is a necessary evil to deal with data life. Mm -hmm. um, aside from Dal, I don't want to see anything get hit. Before Dal dropped, we had a really healthy meta. Like at WSI, I think we had seven different decks in top eight. Mm. Um, you know, we had a lot of different sets represented the meta was honestly really healthy and the only thing that really upset that was data live like we have a lot of different sets were good a lot of stuff countered other things um there's a lot of balance and i think the only thing that really upset that was dal so other than dal i wouldn't want to see anything else get hit with the ban list unless you like you know no actually i take that back we really do need to do something about milky holmes Oh, dude. <laughs> we really need to we need to take care of that. That's As if just, the deck hasn't been problem. hit enough enough. Like, it doesn't even have a level 3. <laughs> doesn't matter. Absolutely broken. Insane. It's crazy how it's SCS talk... still. I know. It's, it's amazing. I, it, we keep talking about Dow like Milky Holmes isn't the problem. It's like we can just ignore like the separate god tier that's like above Data Life with just Milky Holmes. We just don't like to think about it. I like, know. that's... We just, you know, we... We're on full we, copy. We, we just don't think about it. Um, well, I think that wraps everything up. This was really good. Um, I'm really happy with uh, how this podcast and how the one previously turned out. Like, I, I feel like this, is, this has been really good. Um, is there any last things that you guys want to say? Uh, thank you for having us on, uh, for inviting us to be a part of it. I'm um, really glad to be able to get a chance to talk with you and be able to have this opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, man, I, I want to second that for sure. This has been a lot of fun. If you ever want to run it back, let us know because I know that we'd be interested for sure. But oh, I'm looking 100%. forward to, and I'm looking forward to seeing like how this show progresses as well. I think you're a good host, and I think that there's going to be a lot of really good stuff to come out of the conversations you have with uh, with people on the show. So thanks for having us. It was oh. a privilege, and it was really fun. That's great. No, thank you. Um... All right, well, that wraps everything up. Um, thank you again, Brandon Colton from the Clock Tower, for joining me. And um, I'll see you guys next time.